Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to Thee. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So very quickly, a number of people asked why I sometimes refer to Saint Adam and Saint Eve. Yes, they're saints. If you look at the traditional iconography of the Holy Resurrection, or if you read the reading in the Office of Readings on Holy Saturday, the first holy people that our Lord brought out of the limbo of the fathers were Saint Adam and Saint Eve. And I believe their uh, liturgical feast is uh, December 24th on the traditional calendar. You have to remember that the, the tradition of the church tells us that they were created not only genetically perfect, so they were not just physically and mentally perfect, but they were also spiritually created in a very exalted state of holiness. And as we'll see tomorrow, this is very, very important because the natural law should be based on how God created human nature. And one of the problems we have today is that medicine and psychology do not have a clear concept of what is normal. So how do you heal people if you don't know what healthy is? If you look at the arguments that some Catholic intellectuals make to defend homosexuality or transgenderism, they'll point to genetic conditions that are obviously defects. So they're taking something that is a defect and they're saying that that's to be the norm because they've completely lost the concept that God created our first parents perfect and that establishes what is normal. And there's a wonderful saying of one of the desert fathers, Evagrius of Pontus, and he said, God commands us to fast, but he doesn't command us to fast all the time because we die. He says, God commands us to keep vigil, but he doesn't command us to keep vigil all the time because we have to sleep sometimes or we'll die. But he says, God does command us to pray without ceasing because the mind was created to pray. So when you think of St. Adam and St. Eve, when God created them, all they wanted to do from morning till night was to love God with every thought, with every word, with every action. That is normal. That's normal. That's what God created us to be. So yes, St. Adam and St. Eve were saints. Quite a few people have asked about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are real. And God created the marine dinosaurs that live in the ocean on the fifth day of creation. And he created the land-dwelling dinosaurs on the sixth day. And the pterodactyls would have been on the fifth day. And yes... Noah had to take every kind of land-dwelling dinosaur on the ark. But the average size of a dinosaur is about the size of a cow. They weren't all like these enormous T-Rexes. And when he did take a T-Rex kind of dinosaur, it would have been juveniles. He wouldn't have take, taken the big ones. After the flood, the environment all over the earth was much more harsh than it was before the flood. So most of the dinosaurs, of course, were destroyed in the flood because the only ones that survived of the land-dwelling ones were the ones that Noah took on the ark. And you can go to Montana if you like. I've been there. The ranchers up there, they're like professional paleontologists because they have these dinosaur graveyards and typically you will have land-dwelling dinosaurs buried together 
with marine creatures that lived in the ocean, and the ocean is a thousand miles away. We'll see tomorrow. There's no way to explain that except with the global flood. But the dinosaurs that were taken on the ark, um, after, the after the ark landed and the waters receded, it was much more difficult for them to survive. And any of those creatures that were a threat to livestock or to human beings, well then, they were usually hunted down. And the person who could take them out, like St. George, the dinosaur slayer, or Beowulf, for example, of course, those people were heroes. These are not fairy tales. If you read Beowulf, you'll see that Grendel is described like a T-Rex. And Beowulf is based on people that we know were real historical people. So how does Beowulf kill Grendel? She has these enormous jaws that can kill a man. So he gets in close and rips one of her little arms out of its socket. And she goes off and bleeds to death. The word dinosaur was not coined until around 1830 by Sir Richard Owen, no relative of mine as far as I know. But prior to that, they, in English, they were called dragons. Dragons are not fairy tales. Dinosaurs and humans have interacted from the beginning, and it is very possible that there are still living dinosaurs in some very remote areas. On our website, we have an article about um, the pterodactyl that, well, it's about pterosaurs in general, but in Papua New Guinea, it is almost certain that there are still surviving pterosaurs because the uh, environment is very remote, and yet many, many very reliable witnesses have seen these, these creatures. Um, so yes, dinosaurs and humans live together on Earth, and one of the main research projects that our scientists have done is to collect dinosaur bones from many different locations and to then send them to laboratories that can do carbon-14 dating. As you know, carbon-14 is found in all living things. It's formed in the atmosphere when usually cos cosmic rays come into the atmosphere, they collide with nitrogen atoms, they turn them into carbon-14 atoms, and all living things contain carbon. Most of the carbon is carbon-12, which is the stable form of carbon. But for every trillion atoms of carbon-12 in your body right now, you have one atom of carbon-14. When a plant, animal, or human dies, the carbon-14 starts to turn back into nitrogen-14, and it happens very fast. The half-life of carbon-14 is 5,730 years, which means after 50 to 100,000 years, there will not be one single atom of carbon-14 left in the remains of that plant, animal, or human being. So if dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, then of course there won't be any carbon-14 in any dinosaur bone. Right? Wrong. Because every single dinosaur bone that we collected, and some of them we excavated ourselves, every single dinosaur bone contained substantial amounts of carbon-14. We sent them to laboratories where they have a machine called an accelerated mass spectrometer that can count the number of carbon-14 and carbon-12 atoms in the sample. That's how precise they are. And every dinosaur bone had a substantial amount of carbon-14. The dates that we got from the laboratory were from 20 to 30,000 years before the present. Now you may say, that's completely out of the evolution ballpark, but it doesn't exactly seem to fit within the traditional biblical framework that the church always accepted, but it does. And the reason is that we know that the Earth's magnetic field is decaying exponentially. 
scientists have been measuring the strength of the Earth's magnetic field for 200 years. So if you go back to the time of the flood about 4,500 years ago, the Earth's magnetic field would have been so strong that those cosmic rays would have had great difficulty penetrating the atmosphere and turning the nitrogen-14 into carbon-14, which means, logically, the farther back you go, the more you have to shorten those dates to take that into account. So the 20 to 30,000 year dates that we get for the dinosaur bones from five different world-class laboratories logically should be reduced down to four to 5,000 years, which is right within the biblical framework. And then um, one other question was about aliens, extraterrestrials. And very quickly, um, the teaching of the church is clear that there are angels, there are humans, and then there are corporeal creatures on earth. There are no rational corporeal creatures anywhere else in the universe. And it's very, very shocking that many very highly educated Catholic intellectuals, both natural scientists and theologians, are saying that rational corporeal creatures must have evolved in other parts of the universe. And that's not a problem for us because if they did, then Either God would have tested them the way that he tested St. Adam and St. Eve, and if they passed the test, great. And if they flunked the test the way our first parents did, well, then our Lord would have become a Planet X person to redeem them. Well, this is a blasphemy, and it's against the faith, because it's a dogma of the faith that our Lord Jesus Christ had two natures. He had a divine nature, and he had a human nature. He did not have a planet X nature or a planet Y nature. So it is absolutely impossible for there to be any other corporeal, rational creature anywhere else in the universe because if God tested them and they passed the test and they didn't fall into sin, they still suffered the punishment, the, the judgment on the whole universe at the time of the original sin on earth. And that would make God unjust. Because according to their hypothesis, these extraterrestrials have no biological relationship with human beings. Now, the other thing I have to tell you is uh, there are researchers who have thoroughly studied all the evidence for UFOs and extraterrestrials. And one of them is uh, Gary Bates, one of the, our separated brethren at Creation Ministries International. And he'll tell you that he works closely with a man who used to be very big into this uh, ET movement and, and people who had had encounters with extraterrestrials, which were, the, and these were people who were honest and they believed, they described these encounters with what seemed like aliens. Every single one of these encounters turns out to be diabolical. And he records instances where, for example, there was, there was a man who was lying in bed, and all of a sudden, the roof of his house seemed to open up, and he saw a spaceship, and then a beam of light came down, and he felt himself being pulled up. And he said the name of Jesus, and the whole thing disappeared. And one of his associates has apparently got 400 sworn testimonies from people who were having these encounters with what they thought were UFOs, and when they invoked the name of Jesus, the whole thing stopped. So yes, they're real, but they're demonic. They're not extraterrestrial, rational, corporeal creatures. Sometimes people ask me that question, and I say, if you actually look at the structure of those experiences, 
they're not any different than the types of diabolic attacks that people describe who are possessed. So um, not, I'm not suggesting that they all are. Uh, how, do you, how does the spiritual warfare component factor in the error of evolution in science? In the solemn rite of exorcism, there's a certain point where you get to the prayers where you're commanding um, the demons to do certain things. But one of, part of that is you st there's a series of labels in relationship to Satan. So like, for example, in Cider of Incest, um, there's, there's just a number of them. But one of them is um, Dr. Hereticorum, which is the teacher of heretics. And so even though I tend to address when I'm dealing with evolution, I tend to address it primarily from a philosophical point of view. Um, it, the, that's just because that's my forte. It doesn't exclude the fact that I think that, the, that this thing is entirely diabolic in the sense of it just being such a cornerstone to such a broader set of uh, theological errors, um, well, to modernism itself. And so I think in that sense, it actually, it does have a spiritual component to it. I think also it's one of those things that it's uh, on a spiritual level. Once they can get people destabilized in relationship to the truth, and once they can get people to basically reject the Catholic faith on a variety of different levels, they're weakened on a spiritual level, and people are much more easy to, be, to prey upon. It also provides the intellectual framework by which they can drive societies and do certain things, which... Um, if you've watched the series Foundations Restored, you see there are certain societal effects that, get, that are result from this, you know, political effects. And so I think that in that sense, there is a, a definite um, uh, spiritual war war warfare component. Um, but I think it's really more a case of the demons. They came up with the idea, but then they're also um, the ones that are motivating people to follow it. Uh, if we naturally devolve, isn't the spread of evolution an attempt to encourage people to embrace corruption as if it's part of God's creation? I chose this question to answer this because I think that's true. I think that's one of the reasons why you'll hear people, even in the church, say you know things like, um, in fact, he probably just read it recently. I don't know if it was a bishop. I think it was a bishop. But he basically said, well, you know, the reason... Um, that, you know, in the past, if you actually look in Scripture and you look in the past, the history of the church, they never actually understood homosexuality. They never knew what it was. I'm like, have you ever heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? <laughs> have you ever read St. Paul? I mean, you can go down the whole litany of things, which is just absolutely absurd. He's obviously never read um, the, uh, the work by... Um, uh, I'm just wrapping it up now again because I've read it before. But basically the point being is, is that the church has known about this all along. They know it's, it's, a, it's a vitia continuatorum. And he was it's, he's just trying to get this stuff by, but it's this attitude that, well, these acts are no longer evil, right? It's okay now for divorce to happen because we're evolving. It's okay for these things because human beings are changing. Modern man, I'm going to talk a little bit about this tomorrow, there's this attitude that modern man is just fundamentally different than the generations that went before, and that's just not true. I mean, it, it, it just kind of gets me the elation, that's the technical word for it, the elation after the, after the um, Second World War gave the greatest generation this idea that they were different, that things had changed, that humanity had turned a corner, and that things were wonderful and great, and that, you know, that things just no longer apply. We didn't need the disciplines. We didn't need all this stuff. And you're just like, excuse me, you just walked out of a war where tens of millions of people were wiped out. Russia just got done wiping out 20 million people in the Ukraine. You just got, and you just go down the litany last century was the century of death. And you're telling me that somehow modern man is better and that we don't need to be doing all these things? That's just absurd on the face of it, right? So there was this shift, but it's all because of this. Again, things are always progressing for the better. And this is idea that somehow or another our generation is more superior and better than the others. And that's just simply not true. But in the process of that, it also meant that 
the, the church didn't have to have these disciplines anymore. The church didn't have to condemn homosexuality or fornication or adultery or divorce and all these things. The church didn't have to do these things because man is changing, and that's why homosexual, homosexual marriage is acceptable because man is changing. No, he's not. Human nature doesn't change. The essence of human nature does not change. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, I think evolution, uh, part of it's the Hegelian dialectic, which also undergirds evolution, but it is evolution that's in the minds of these people, or at least being used to, uh, to push this stuff forward. And this is why you'll hear them say things, well, well we, we can never go back. Well, it's not a matter of going back. It's just a matter of embracing what's being handed to you by the entire tradition of the church, right? So anyway, that being said, we could stand here for a while and yammer about that. Okay. What is your opinion on technology and IA? Well, technology in and of itself is a good. It would be, it'd be, it's, uh, it's a useful good, as St. Thomas says. So there's three kinds of good. There's the useful good. But then there's also the truly good and then um, the apparent good. But the point being is, is that it can be a useful good the point, as a useful good, it can actually be wonderful. I mean, you can just see that by virtue of the fact that we can stream stuff about evolution on the Internet, right? I don't know how long the government's going to let us do that, but you know how it is. All right. So technology in and of itself is a good. It's the use of it that becomes a problem in two ways. One is that because it's a good, we get a certain pleasure out of its use, and so that has to be moderated through um, uh a, and the amount that you use it, but then also when you use it, you have to do things to, um, to overcome the intemperance that it can actually beget. Um, and then AI, artificial intelligence. You know, I think that there's, a, there's some errors kind of floating around in relationship to um, most people's perception of it because it's how it's being presented. But AI is still just basic, it's, it's still programming. It's just based on probabilities and it does a series of things and it, it looks at a series of things and then rules out certain things so that you end up coming to what is the, the proper conclusion. But it's still the programming that determines how it's gonna assess those probabilities. So in the end, it's what the human beings determine in the programming and then you have the other thing of garbage in, garbage out. It still applies. So. If the programming is done in such a way where it restricts the input into the thing so that the only thing that can come out the other end are woke answers, which we're seeing on some of these things, that like if you use chat GBT, that's actually what you're gonna get is a bunch of woke stuff because it's been programmed into it. So AI of itself can be a good thing as long as it's restricted to certain things, it's kept within a certain uh, set of parameters and the programming is done right, et cetera. But, um, I'm a fr but it can also be used for evil, right? So people can use it to promote all sorts of, uh, I mean, if you program an AI program to actually come up with the best possible diabolic curses, well, it's probably going to turn out some pretty good stuff over the course of time, right? Okay. So the point being is it's like any other form of technology. I do think it, there has to be some ethics rules and certain things imposed in relationship to its use, but... Do you think this was given to us by demons? I don't. If you actually look at AI and its development, what they did is they just modeled it against the human brain. So they look at how the human brain basically makes associations, and they basically taught, the, uh, taught but they programmed the computers to be able to, based on probabilities of how certain things would outcome, but then also you know, by giving it basic data, what the connections of things were. And so it, it basically functions like a human brain or any other kind of brain, technically. So it's, it basically functions like a, develop, a, a restricted but a developed form of what's called the cogitative power, which is part of the brain's ability to make associations. So it's basically they're just training it to do that. So I don't think it's demonic in and of itself. It doesn't mean that it can't devolve into that depending on what human beings do with it. So. Someone asked about the statement of uh, Pope St. John Paul II when uh, he's alleged to have said in 1996 that uh, evolution is more than a hypothesis. There's actually a lot more <laughs> to that story. And we know for a fact that uh, the Holy Father actually never gave that address. And 
the theologian who wrote the speech that wasn't given but which was reported in the mass media uh, did not get it approved by the theologian of the papal household. However, we would not deny that Pope St. John Paul II basically agreed with what the speech said. But the fact that it was presented to the world as something that he actually did say tells you something about the interest that the mass media has in promoting evolution and in giving the impression that it's perfectly acceptable to Catholics. Now, you have to understand that when Vatican I defined papal infallibility, the Council Fathers defined it very precisely. They specifically say that this gift of infallibility is not given to the Pope to define any new doctrine, but only to define a doctrine of faith or morals that is contained in the deposit of faith that was handed down from the apostles. And you can look at all the statements of Pope St. John Paul II favorable to the evolutionary hypothesis or any other recent pope. You will not find one where they find molecules to man evolution or a microbe to man evolution in the deposit of faith. That's number one. Any statement that they made favorable to evolution was made of it as a hypothesis in natural science. And popes are not infallible when they give their opinions about hypotheses in natural science. Pope Francis believes that human activity ca is causing global warming. Well, that's a hypothesis in natural science. If you study and you discover, for example, that there was substantial global warming in the Middle Ages when no one was driving SUVs or burning coal in coal plants, then you're being a good son of the church or daughter of the church if you respectfully show the church leadership that the evidence simply doesn't support this hypothesis. That's not being disobedient because the Pope is merely giving an opinion about something in the realm of natural science. Now, if you look at what Pope Pius XII in Humani Generis and Pope St. John Paul II wrote when they were writing in the realm of theology and philosophy, you'll find that they actually asked us to do things which if we obeyed them would lead to the complete rejection of the molecules to man evolution hypothesis. Because in Humani Generis, uh, Pope Pius XII asked that Catholic theologians and philosophers apply the traditional prin metaphysical principles of Catholic philosophy to the examination of the evolutionary hypothesis. And in Fides et Ratio, Pope St. John Paul II made the same appeal. Well, Father Ribberger has proved to you that when you obey Pope St. John Paul II in Fides et Ratio, and you apply these principles to the evolutionary hypothesis, it flunks the test. So Pope St. John Paul II, in his more authoritative teaching, gives us the guidelines, which if we follow them, will lead to the rejection of the evolutionary hypothesis. Now, the other uh, point that's important to make is that we cannot fault the popes if all of the scientists in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences are telling him that evolution is a sound hypothesis. And you have to understand that because the Pontifical Academy of Sciences has become like a self-selecting body, and they all believe in evolution, they're only selecting people for membership who hold to this view. And they are not only 100% in favor of evolution, I mean the molecules to man evolution hypothesis, they're totally in favor of brain death as the criterion for human death. They're in favor of GMO food as the solution to the problem of hunger in the third world. And they're all in favor of limiting family size to one or two children. This is absolutely absurd. But this is because they have all accepted this false 
evolutionary framework. Now, the other thing that's important to understand is that these scientists can point to phenomena that seem to support their view. I'll give you an example. There's um, a kind of lizard in Puerto Rico uh, called the crested anole. And the scientists were amazed because the environment where they live changed very rapidly to an urban environment from being a natural environment. And lo and behold, in just a few generations, these lizards grew much longer legs and sprouted little appendages on their limbs so that they could climb walls, whereas before they were normally climbing trees. So of course you had scientists saying, this is evolution in action. Look, look at this happening before our eyes. And if something like that were shown to the Pope, unless he has knowledge of genetics and biology beyond the average person, that could be very impressive. But what you have to understand is, when the scientists looked at what was happening to these lizards at the genetic level, there were over 30 different genes that were activated that were resulting in the longer limbs and these appendages that allowed them to climb on walls in urban areas. Clearly, God wrote the programming into their genome. And the irony is that the consensus view among biologists from the 1970s to the 1990s was that the DNA in our bodies that does not code for protein was junk, left over from the millions of years of evolution. And since only 2% of our DNA tells little molecular machines in our cells how to put amino acids together to make proteins, which are the building blocks of our bodies, that meant that about 98% of our DNA was just a useless holdover from the millions of years of evolution. Well, that was a little bit much, even for some of the evolutionists, to think that 98% of our DNA was junk. And so finally, they got funding for Project ENCODE to study the so-called junk DNA. And of course, they find, found out that it's not junk after all. In fact, the, the so-called junk DNA operates at a higher level than the DNA that codes for protein. It switches on and off different genetic mechanisms. And so what happened with these lizards is God had written into the genome of the original lizard ancestors of these crested anoles in Puerto Rico, the potential to adapt to different kinds of environments. And so when the environment changes, it's not that the environment has a mind <laughs> and changes the lizard, but the God has designed the creatures so that certain triggers will activate these genetic programs. And that's why in a very short span of just a few generations, you could see these new features appearing. But it has nothing to do with evolution because all the information for those features was programmed into the genome of that organism from the beginning. And finally, um, we were asked about the Big Bang hypothesis. And I would encourage you to go to the Colby Center website, www.colbaycenter.org, and read the article by Dr. Thomas Seiler, who has a PhD in physics from the Technical University of Munich, and see his critique of the uh, Big Bang hypothesis. And as Father Rippiger mentioned, the Big Bang hypothesis is so contradictory now to observed evidence that according to the standard model, 95% of the matter in the universe cannot be seen, cannot be observed, and nobody knows what it is. It's, it's dark energy and dark matter. Now, that is not science. When 95% of what you can actually measure and observe is, is not part of what supports 
your hypothesis, it's, it's time for a new hypothesis. And Dr. Seiler shows, for example, that even the most ardent Big Bang cosmologists admit that they cannot explain how stars came into existence. What students are told is that gas particles somehow condensed to form the first stars. But this goes against the reality of the physical nature of things because gravity is much weaker than gas pressure. So before gas particles ever condense to form the nucleus of a star by gravity, gas pressure is going to drive them apart. So the only realistic accounts of star formation that the Big Bang cosmologists can offer are scenarios where, for example, a star explodes and it creates these certain special conditions where a star could form. But that doesn't tell you how the first stars came into existence. So the best explanation for how the first stars came into ex existence is in the sacred history of Genesis where Moses says, and he made the stars also. <laughs> okay, it's 10 o'clock, so we have to um, end for tonight. We hope everybody comes back tomorrow. Remember, start time registration at 10, um, but you can get in here any time up until 11 or after, but 11 o'clock is the new start time, okay? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. We should have um, final blessing, my father. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti Supervos, Sit Maniat Semper. Amen. <laughs>